Yeah. And the FIRE movement, the people who are going about this process of saving and investing in the stock market index or real estate or whatever they're doing, they intuitively understand this. The same way that Bitcoiners very clearly understand this because we spend time focusing on it, but they intuitively understand it. And that's why they approach their personal finance the way that they do. That's why the FIRE movement works is because they intuitively see this problem that the money is broken. Bitcoin fits into that framework very, very well because it is the apex predator of financial assets that will grow, especially at this point in time in history, will grow much faster than the stock market index or real estate or anything else, right? Everything is going to zero versus Bitcoin, as we like to say. And so because the fire movement is using these other vehicles, not really as investments, but as savings vehicles, they should be well primed to see Bitcoin as the ultimate savings vehicle and bring that into their framework and start making an allocation to it. And then ultimately, yeah. if you get to the level of understanding and conviction that you and I have, perhaps it can be their primary savings vehicle the way that I've adopted it. All right, Trey Sellers, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thank you, Brown. Great to be with you. Yeah, great to have you. I think we have a fun topic to chat about. I, I just mentioned to you before we started recording, like, I know about FIRE, like the FIRE movement. I don't even know if I, I know the acronym exactly, but we'll talk about that. But yeah, you're, you're deep into that and deep into Bitcoin. And I think these topics... Uh, touch each other a lot and uh, you even argue that bitcoin you know is fire friendly from my experience talking to people who are into fire i haven't had that many enthusiastic responses to bitcoin so i think you found like the perfect venn diagram to to see if if, if, if there's something there and to show them also yeah and you recently started a, a newsletter to uh, to do that yeah fire stands for financial independence retire early and yeah. It is an approach to personal finance that focuses on kind of maximizing the savings that you are keeping and investing those savings in vehicles that can allow you to compound the wealth that you have over hopefully a fairly short period of time so that you can accelerate your, your path to the ability to retire. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you actually need to or would want to retire, but to get to a place where you have financial independence in the sense of not being forced to work on a day-to-day -day basis in a job that you don't like for a boss that, you know, is is a pain in your butt and, you know, doing the commute on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. taking you away from your family, as opposed to maybe working on something that you're really passionate about that is intellectually stimulating and that kind of thing. I think, you know, a lot of people, and maybe this has something to do with the fiat financial world, they get stuck in these ruts, right? You, you get some type of like golden handcuffs or you just feel like the day-to-day -day track that you're on is difficult to jump off of and move in a different direction. And sometimes that's true, right? We all have obligations in our personal lives and the the place that we've chosen to live and all that. And it can be very difficult to change your mindset enough to take serious action to change the course of your life. I think the FIRE philosophy really is about just setting some intentionality to accelerate that portion of your life mm -hmm. that you're not enjoying so much so that you can feel free to pursue some of these other things without having to worry about where your next meal is going to come from, so to speak. Um, yeah. And so that, that financial independence piece of it really hit home for me after being in corporate America for you know quite some time and just never really loving what I did. And when I, when I kind of came across this approach, it wasn't like I wasn't already thinking about my personal finances and trying to put a little bit of money away, but there was no real framework or intentionality behind exactly how I was going to do this and what kind of goals I was going to set and how I was going to really maximize that savings rate and maximize the investments that I was making so that I could actually intentionally accelerate that timeline. So it really felt like a breath of fresh air for me to start down that path. And along the, sa along the same time, I was really developing my deep 
conviction in Bitcoin. And so there was kind of a natural proclivity for me to start to really focus on that as a primary savings vehicle, as opposed to stock market index investing, which is what I've been doing prior to that. Yeah. Isn't that also like what, so, so from my understanding from this, you know, as you said, the financial independence is, you know, you, you just create a space that you can more decide like what, what you want to do. Right. But, and, and so you don't necessarily retire, but like from my understanding, there's also some like frugal living incorporated in this, or, you know, at least from what I've seen or, or heard. Right. And then, you know, you have excess money that you then just invest in this compounding fund. Like what do people generally use to do this? Is this a combination of, yeah, like frugal living and investing in high compounding or just over longer time frame like ETFs and stuff? Or, or like w- what's the general approach? There are a few different ways that people think about spending. And this is kind of like a it's a personal choice and almost like a personality type of thing. There are some people that take the frugalness to really an extreme. We call this lean fire and they are very much cutting out any bit of what they would call waste, what I would call luxury in their lives in order to to pinch pennies essentially, right? Every single penny, every single dollar that you're able to save goes toward those investments that you're making and you know the more and the faster that you put this money away and put it into a vehicle that's working for you the faster it will compound and by keeping your expenses super super low you can actually do the math where you don't need all that large of a portfolio in order to sustain that lifestyle i do not at all subscribe to that approach. Um, I am more of what's called a fat fire type of practitioner where I don't want to eat rice and beans and mm-hmm. live in a camper and, you know, be living the bare bones in life, right? Like I still want to enjoy not only the time that I'm living now as I'm going about this fire journey, but also, you know, it's a long time beyond the time where you would reach financial independence where living that type of frugal lifestyle just does not appeal to me, right? And so it really is a personal decision as to what do you want your lifestyle to look like in that financial independence period, which could be 10 years, could be 20 years, could be 30 years, could be more than that, depending on how early you've gotten started and and the amount that you're able to save and your income level and all of these different factors. But, you know, most people, I think, either fall in the middle there where they're willing to give up a little bit to save a little bit extra, but they're not willing to, you know, sleep in a cardboard box in order to make this happen, right? Like we've got lives to live and you may not wake up tomorrow. So you you might want to, you know, do a little bit of maximizing for now in order to make sure that you're actually enjoying the the life that you have now while you're young and while you can move around, have mobility, have your health, all of that kind of thing. So yeah. there's a balance to be struck for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I like this idea of being intentional or start with being conscious about how do I want to live, right? I mean, we'll, we'll talk about uh, working in the banking world or stuck in this rat race, but a lot of people just do, right? I mean, I think I am to some degree still also doing that right like it's hard to take a moment in time reflect and be like okay this is what i do want to do this is what i don't want to do but also you know if 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 you have kids and they're older like where do i want to be how do i want to live like all these things that is what i think appeals to me just in general right but what do you say with this achieving this financial independence earlier you would be able to already kind of like live this life or at least get there quicker Right. But if you are the fat, fire, fat fire person, doesn't that take then a longer time to get there? Or like, how do you, how do you juggle? How do you juggle that? Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi signature fold for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. 
OnRAM's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrambitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. All other things being equal, yeah, it probably will take you a little bit longer, right? So yeah. again, it's a personal decision. Are you going to commit to working a few years longer to save a larger nest egg or portfolio that can support a better lifestyle, a more luxurious lifestyle, like you know, living in a, a nice big house with an, a backyard where your taxes are going to be higher and maybe you've got a mortgage and all this other stuff versus a super simple living in like a one bedroom apartment where you're stuffing your kids in, you know, into this really tiny place or something. It's like, yes, if that is the lifestyle that you really want to live, you can retire or you can reach that financial independence threshold much earlier. But for me, I would much rather put in more work over a longer period of time and spend some money now and and enjoy the the life and the health and the family that I've got and the friends that I've got and the vacations and that kind of thing now. And then even though I've got to work for a little bit longer, I'm I'm still able to to really optimize for now while not sacrificing too much of the future there, right? Yeah. The way I like to think about this in in a lot of ways is you know, when you set out a plan and you you go out on this fire journey is you're really working from the future and working backwards. So a lot of people will take advantage of retirement accounts and tax advantaged accounts that we have in the US. By the way, the fire movement is very much a US focused phenomenon which we can we can talk about maybe a little bit later. So and and I live in the US and that is my experience. So we have specialized types of retirement accounts and they give you certain tax advantages and allow you to save without the drag of taxes over a long period of time. Um, so that could be a 401k or a traditional or Roth IRA, or uh, there are other types out there as well. And so I think of these as like, okay, these are the uh, accounts that you're setting up that is meant to sustain you when you're, when you're really old, right? So like when you're 80, 90, 95 or whatever, you're starting to save from there to take care of those elderly years. And then the more you save, the more you're able to bring that date forward into the present, as opposed to working up toward this big goal in the future. Like for me, for me, that mental shift or twist there in, in saying that I'm working backwards toward the now, but taking care of the later years, you know, first, that yeah. really helps me to keep things grounded in the way that I'm approaching this. I don't know if that works for everybody else, but but that's how I approach it. Yeah, because there's basically two parts, right? The financial independence. I, I don't, to me, it sounds like it's not about not working, right? It, it's not about stopping having a, having a job or doing a venture or whatever you want, but it's rather having more of the choice, the freedom to move also between different jobs to figure out like, what is the thing that I would actually like to spend more time on and, yeah, I see kind of that, like the retire early is the actual that would involve not working. <laughs> I, I don't know. It sounds like that. It, it does, you know, literally speaking and generally speaking, you could also think of this as just, hey, I'm going to retire from the rat race, meaning I'm no longer going to work this job that I hate with the boss that I hate, you know, and, and yeah, that, exactly. all that commute like yeah. we were talking about first. I'm going to retire from that lifestyle, but that doesn't mean that you have to go to zero income, zero working. Like for me, I want to stay engaged on an intellectual standpoint. I happen to work in the Bitcoin industry for a Bitcoin company and, you know, Bitcoin and its adoption and helping to further that is a passion of mine and something that I'm going to want to continue to work toward for the rest of my working life or my career. Right. And so, yeah. you know, if I get to a point where I have, you know, my, my time with Unchained comes to an end some point in the future. And I'm at a point where I'm financially independent, which pretty much there already, actually, thanks to Bitcoin, by the way, which we can we can talk about. But mm -hmm. you know, you get to that place, it's not like I'm just gonna go play golf all day, every day for the rest of my life. Like I'll definitely play a lot more golf. hundred yeah. percent. Right. But that's not, you know, 
holistically fulfilling for me, I will want to continue to help with Bitcoin adoption, work with companies in the space, teach people about financial independence and Bitcoin, which I'm doing with this newsletter, and you know, continue to find ways to stay intellectually stimulated and stay in the mix, so to speak. Yeah. And that's naturally going to come with some type of income. Which actually, if there is some income that you can expect in the future, the portfolio amount or the number that you need to get to can actually be lowered. So if you decide going into your plan, hey, okay, I've got this job and I hate it and I make X amount of money or whatever, and I'm able to save this amount. Okay, this is my fire number. We can talk about the calculations to to kind of get there and some of the different methodologies. But if you've got that number laid out, that may be assuming that you are going to go from working 100% and having this income to zero working and zero income. But if you go to working part-time, working half-time on something that you love or just something that is a little more leisurely that you like, that provides some stimulation there or whatever, now all of a sudden you actually don't need that higher number anymore because the excess expenses that you have on a daily basis are not that that delta from your working life to your non-working mm-hmm. life is not so great. Um, yeah. So again, it's a blend. It's personal. Uh, everybody's yeah, got to sure. figure out exactly how they want to approach that. And it can evolve over time, right? You can start with one plan. And as things evolve, as your mindset shifts, as you get interested in other things, as Bitcoin comes into your life or whatever the case might be, you can you can change and shift on that. And I think having that mentality going in is really helpful as well, right? Yeah. You were to reach your fire number and you decide, okay, I'm going to take two years off and see how things go. And then the market goes way down or your, your Bitcoin position, the thing that you were planning on retiring goes way down. Well, you know, as long as you've gone into that with the mentality of, hey, I can always go back to work or work mm-hmm. part time or whatever that I'm going to bridge the gap. Maybe I'm going to move and go live in South America where it's much cheaper. Like if you if you think about these possibilities ahead of time and build a little bit of a contingency plan there and you're comfortable with it, it opens up a world of possibilities that a lot of us just have not ever considered because the culture is to not consider those things. That's really what I think the fire movement brings in terms of a a fresh perspective there. Yeah. In that way, I do see a big similarity between fire and bitcoin specifically in that sense as you said right like a lot of people are just working and doing things not in a conscious way right and this is kind of like having this check and choosing or creating the options then choosing what you would like to follow and then do that in a conscious way right like, yeah i think that's very cool what's your what's your golf handicap by the way right now i'm playing around a 12 or so Oh, nice. uh, so I'm, I'm a decent player. I'm I'm generally in the 80s, you know. But okay, nice. If I'm ever around, yeah. I'm I'm 13 something. So we'll be oh, uh, we'll have a nice match. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. good, very good. Well, maybe this is a good opportunity to just shout out. We are doing Unchained is is a headline sponsor here, a golf event called the Max and Stacy Bitcoin Golf oh, yeah. Invitational in El Salvador, January 10th and 11th. Uh, it's a two day event. And I'm sorry to say, or excited to say that it, the thing sold out in like 45 minutes after we super announced fun. it. So that's nice. super cool. But we're working with a great new company, some good Bitcoiners in, in the space that are operating the Bitcoin Sports Network. And so there's going to be a lot more of these golf events and other sporting events that they are helping to, to put on. And, and I've been trying to contribute to these types of things as much as I can, especially if they're focused on golf. But Nice. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. So how can someone create like an intentional strategy for saving and investments? What in general, what, what's like the, what, what are the first three things to, to consider? Yeah. So everything starts from what your expenses are, because that's the baseline that you need to cover if you want to build a portfolio that can sustain your lifestyle. So whether the expenses side of that equation is what is aspirational to you in this timeline, or if you're thinking about what do I actually spend and I want to carry that lifestyle forward into the future, or maybe you have some very aspirational type of expenses that you want to get to that like exclusive golf membership that's going to cost you $10,000 a year or more, right? You just need to take some time to map out 
what those expenses are, what you expect them to be in the future, and and do that kind of at the line item level, right? So that you can add all that up and say, okay, this is what I expect my expenses to be in an ongoing fashion on an annual basis. From that number, you can calculate what type of portfolio or what size of portfolio that you need to have in order to sustain that level of spending that you expect. So step number one is just understand what your expenses are and get a really good sense of the things that you're spending money on that you don't really need. Like maybe there's a good opportunity to cut some of that stuff out. Any incremental savings that can that can be generated will help you to get to that that financial independence number a little bit faster. Like again, in my approach here is don't go crazy, right? If you've got a decent income, you're able to save a good amount, there's no reason that you can't go for the occasional Starbucks and spend, you know, five, six bucks on a on a coffee, right? Like this is kind of the classic example. Oh, you should yeah. cut out your coffees because you you'll save an extra like one thousand dollars per year. And it's like, okay, that's true. But if those coffees are going to, you know, make new connections and network and just enjoy yourself with friends, or it's nice to get out of the office for an afternoon break to have a little coffee to make it through the next couple of hours. Like there's no reason in my mind that Mm -hmm. saving that extra three, four or five bucks on a daily, weekly basis or whatever is going to make a major impact. So you should start thinking about these things from the, the larger expenses first, and then kind of work your way down. That doesn't mean you should waste money on stupid stuff that you don't use, but you know, just keep things in perspective there. So the expenses yep. piece of it is is absolutely the first step. And then, you know, I continue, even though I've got Bitcoin as my primary savings vehicle, which grows a lot faster than the historical rate of the S P five hundred or the stock market, which I used to have as my primary vehicle, I still use the four percent rule. And the 4% rule basically says that for every $40,000 of expenses that you have on an annual basis, you need a portfolio that is $1 million in size. And once you've reached that, you've kind of reached that fire number, that financial independence number. And historically speaking, based on the historical record, you should be able to sustain retirement, sustain that level of expenses by just selling down a portion yeah. of your for- portfolio, about 44% on a yearly basis. And actually, in most cases, you'll end up with a much larger portfolio than what you started with. Um, there are only a few historical timeframes that you that would not be the case and you would run out of money before like a 30-year period. But again, like as you're going into this, you can think about the contingency plans there and and how you can adjust. It's not like a static type of thing. Um, yeah. And then Inter- the the final thing yeah. here is is just like being very intentional about making sure that you're paying yourself first. So there's an old book called The Richest Man in Babylon, and the the core insight that I got from from this book and reading it like years ago is take ten percent of whatever you make doesn't matter how much it is. And before you pay anybody else, you pay yourself. You put that away into the savings vehicle of your choice, right? I prefer Bitcoin, but you put that away and then everything else is what you have left to pay your bills. And you need to make sure your bills fit into that other 90%. But in doing so, you're setting an intentional goal of saving that 10%. Now, that doesn't mean you have to stop there. But at the very least, like that is the baseline. Start at 10% and then work your way up. Can you make it to 20%? Can you make it to 40%? Can you make it to 50%? Some people do. And you're really going to accelerate your timeline to financial independence if you're able to do that. Some of that has to do with the amount of money you make. Some of it has to do with the amount of, of expenses that you have. But you know, based on your personal situation, start with that 10% baseline and then work from there. I love that. I think that's an, that's an interesting approach to, to personal finance in, in general, right? Because if you would not be able to sustain what's left, that 90%, that's either, that, then you have new choices, right? That's either too much and you have to cut down, right? Or you can force yourself to try to earn more. So there's then again, like these different routes that, that you can go on. It's funny that my, when you say like, okay, the 4% rule, 40,000, you know, that's then, for 25 years, you can just sell 
that that portion of of well what what you saved in in whatever asset right but then i think like okay that would assume that you would be able to so so what is that 40k is based on that that would fund your lifestyle right and your home etc like that would fund your life each year is that correct well it's 40 it's a million dollars saved for every $40,000 yeah. in expenses. So if your yeah, annual yeah. expenses, you expect uh, like that, $80,000, uh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your, yeah. your target is 2 million. If you gotcha. expect it to be a hundred thousand dollars, your target is two and a half million. Right. And gotcha. so it, right. you take, take that annual expense number, multiply yeah. it by 25 yeah. and, and that's going to be the kind of general rule of thumb. This is yeah. not, this is not scientific in the sense of like, no, no, no. I got you. I got you. I like, I, yeah. Plus equals three. Yeah. Uh, it is a, it's directionally correct, yeah. right? It's a framework yeah. to work from and a way to track your progress toward this goal that you're making. Yeah, okay, so I didn't interpret that correctly, but the other thing where my Bitcoin mind went is like, okay, but how much can I buy, you know, after 15 years when I'm selling off this portion of whatever I'm storing it in, right? And again, so from what I've seen from, from, the, from the FIRE movement, right, they are looking into, know compounding interest they are in you know etfs a lot they just reinvest everything that they get back right so that they're compounding but what i found interesting is like they are a lot of a lot of people again my perception is just like you know these are like geeks nerds that like to research and figure all these things out right like it, this is like i'd say personal finance uh, 2 or 3.0 right so these are people that like to make spreadsheets and you know, analyze and, and, and do these things. But yeah, they're looking, never really... for some, they're looking for some kind of strange, new, quirky way to like save a little bit extra or yeah. you know, invest in this obscure thing that nobody else knows that you get like, you know, point point one percent extra interest or they're like exactly will do, you know, they're they're hopping between banks in order to take care of exactly uh, this advantage of these like nine hundred dollar bonuses that you get if yes. you deposit a certain amount. Hey, yes. you know, if, if you want to go through that, like that is extra cash. That's, that's, oh, yeah, no. but, but you're right. There, there is that type of like culture strain in, yeah. in a lot of these communities. No, I meant it as a compliment too. Like, I mean, more so like the type of person that would go into this. Right. Yeah. But yeah, if my question or, or my mind then goes to, okay, but then in like 20 years, you know, you have an X amount saved. You say like, okay, my, my, my lifestyle that I envision is let's say a hundred K a year or, well, you know, that's an arbitrary number, but yeah, what does hundred K buy me in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years? Right. And that conversation, I don't, I haven't really seen happening because they kind of connected back to, okay, but it's compounding. So it'll be more anyway. It's kind of like, like this, but of course, once you go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and, and you think like, okay, you know, debt spiral is accelerating, uh, money printing is accelerating, you know, inflation is going to accelerate. Where is this going to go? And, and because the future becomes so much more unpredictable because we have all this debasement of the currency and this inflation, that, that is of course why we eventually get into, into Bitcoin. But can you explain like, why is Bitcoin yeah, so fire friendly? Is it this? And also, how do you see kind of this compounding interest argument versus, I want to, you know, say just price appreciation, you know, how, how can people compare these, these two things? Yeah. Well, an important point first is that, you know, inflation is a vector. It is different for everybody. The things that you are basing your expenses on are going to be different than, than I am basing my expenses on. I mean, we live, you know, across the world from each other, right? Like things in the Netherlands versus things in Atlanta, Georgia are going to be different in terms of the rates that they are increasing or decreasing in price and that kind of thing. So, but I, I also think it's important to just point out that the numbers that we're talking about, this 4% rule and the, the 25 times your annual expenses, all of that is it comes from something called the Trinity study. Um, it was a study done a couple decades, couple decades ago, looking at historical returns for the stock market and bond market and how a portfolio would fare relative to inflation and that kind of thing in order to sustain a retirement time span. And the, the Trinity study focused on a 30 year time span. And the essence of the results of that was that if you are aiming for a 4% withdrawal rate in 95 plus cases of this study, 
you will make it through that 30 years without running out of money. And mm-hmm. in fact, in a large portion of those, you'll actually have a lot more money than you started with because, and, and it's really just a sequence of, res- of withdrawals or sequence of returns type of situation there where, you know, if you, if you were to retire at the, if you hit your, your financial independence number in early, early 2007 and the market gets cut in half or in, you know, by, by 60% within the first like year of your retirement, um, yeah. it might be difficult to actually sustain that 30 years. You may have to go back to work, right? If you, mm. if you just cross that threshold, yeah. but for most other time periods, historically speaking, that, that 25 X, that 4% rule is more than enough to sustain those 30 years. And, and then you have a lot left over. So that's where all of this comes from. And then, you know, in addition to that, it actually is adjusted for inflation as they are defining it, right? Like, which is okay. typically a CPI type of thing. You and I both know, and, and most Bitcoiners know that CPI is a lie. Again, inflation is a vector. It's very different for different people and it excludes certain things and there's hedonic adjustments and all of this other craziness. Like inflation is not running at 3% for higher education in the U S or healthcare in the U S you know, all of these things that the government just happens to be very strongly involved in (laughs) just happen to go up faster than, than the average inflation rate. Um, imagine that, but, but those are things that people use and people need and people need to depend on or, or account for in their, in their fire journey. So that's, that's important to just note, like that's where those numbers are coming from. And it does account for inflation. The reason that I am talking about Bitcoin as being fire friendly is really that what I see is a, an overlap in the understanding of what is happening, what is happening in the macro framework, in the financial world, in the fact that you need to save this huge amount of money in order to retire and all of that is driven from the fact that the money is broken. And because the money is broken, you need to earn more and more and in order to cover those expenses that continually increase in price. And you get to a place where unless you are becoming an investor, unless you are taking a proactive approach to save and invest, you're never going to be able to stop working, right? It, life becomes more and more expensive over time. And the fire movement, the people who are going about this process of saving and investing in stock market index or real estate or whatever they're doing, they intuitively understand this. The same way that Bitcoiners very clearly understand this because we spend time focusing on it, but they intuitively understand it. And that's why they approach their personal finance the way that they do. That's why the FIRE movement works is because they intuitively see this problem that the money is broken and the solution that they have actually works to solve that problem and keep them ahead of the curve to take advantage of that compounding nature. So with that intuitive understanding as an overlap to what Bitcoiners very consciously understand, Bitcoin fits into that framework very, very well because it is the apex predator of financial assets that will grow, especially at this point in time in history, will grow much faster than the stock market index or real estate or anything else, right? Everything is, is going to zero versus Bitcoin, as we, as we like to say. And so because the fire movement is using these other vehicles, not really as investments, but as savings vehicles, they should be well primed to see Bitcoin as the ultimate savings vehicle and bring that into their framework and start making an allocation to it. And then ultimately, if you get to the level of understanding and conviction that you and I have, perhaps it can be their primary savings vehicle the way that I've adopted it. Let's say someone is listening who's interested in this fire movement. And of of course, I'm going to try to play the YouTube game with a nice thumbnail and a title. So maybe some fire people are listening. When you just said, you know, Bitcoin is going to eat everything else. Like I totally understand what you are saying, but, and, and I, I told you before we started recording, you know, I've been in the fire subreddit sometimes and I mentioned Bitcoin and people, you know, they, they go crazy. In short, what is the pitch or what is your explanation as to, you know, why you use this argument as what you just said, right? So you said, okay, Bitcoin is fire friendly because eventually 
it will eat up all these vehicles that people use to save, right? That is why it will appreciate in price, right? More of this economic value is going to be poured into this, you know, absolute scarcity, scarce asset. So that's why it's going to appreciate. And that monetary energy will come from all these assets that people currently use. Well, maybe I'm pitching this now, by the way. But I wanted to frame it as a question because I think this is what but it, it, it puts people off in some way when you say something like this. And like I just explained it, but I yeah, it's just I came to this understanding, right? And I think people who who hear that for the first time, they're like, yeah, okay, it's it's not actually a strong argument. It sounds too good to be true. Right. I think in general with Bitcoin, it sounds too good to be true. That's why it's difficult. But yeah, what's your what's your take on this? Like, how can we explain this better or more inviting, perhaps? Well, the the reason that Bitcoin will continue to subsume economic em- energy from the stock market, from real estate and from other assets that are being used as stores of value is because it is substantially better as a store of value and for that purpose. So, you know, real estate, for example, has this massive monetary premium because it's relatively scarce. Like it's hard to build new real estate. It, you know, takes time. It takes a lot of energy. There's some proof of work, as we would say, that goes into doing that. And it has done very well as a investment in the US at least. Um, but I think around the world and in other developed markets, primarily because it is levered and it is subsidized by some rules from the government and the tax authorities. And so, but that does not mean that it doesn't have downsides. And those downsides are that it's immobile. It's very illiquid. It has very high transaction costs. It has maintenance and depreciation that is just built into the fact that it's a physical item. You've got to deal with tenants. If you're looking at this from an investment standpoint, there are all kinds of friction built into owning real estate and you're subject to the local jurisdiction for wherever that piece of property is. And if for whatever reason, the local government decides that your property is encroaching on their plans for expansion or whatever, they can they can take that from you or they can tax you more or whatever the case is, right? It's it's there and it's very vulnerable to a lot of these different types of frictions. And the stock market has similar but different types of downsides and frictions as a store value asset. The first and and probably primary thing that I would point out here is that Again, the fire movement has a very US centric view. Most of the influencers in the fire movement that, that at least I've been exposed to are from the US. They're kind of the leaders of, of this way of thinking. And the US has enjoyed a lead on the globe in terms of an economic standpoint for a very long time. And this strategy around buying a stock market index works very well if you're stock market that you have access to is outperforming the rest of the world. And that's what Mm -hmm. the US stock market has done. But, you know, for the rest of the world that does not necessarily have access to any stock market at all, at all, let alone the S&P 500 or the US stock market, they, they might not even have that choice, let alone the choice that they might have is going to underperform or perhaps even not perform at all and, and lead to, to losses and purchasing power there. Beyond that, you are locked in the traditional financial system. You are working with intermediaries who can summarily execute your account, you know, at a whim. If you turn out to be on the wrong side of some kind of political movement or say the wrong thing on social media, or even just get mixed up with, with somebody like your name is confused with somebody else who's on some type of terrorist watch list or something like that, right? Like all kinds of different things can happen that make you vulnerable to this asset that you're using as a store of value, not being available to you, taxed to oblivion, illiquid at the the wrong times, right? Like you can't access your money on the weekend if it's mm-hmm. in the stock market. Yeah. It just doesn't work like that, right? Yeah. Um, so all of these downsides are downsides that Bitcoin does not suffer from. And it is made purely as a store of value and as a monetary system and a monetary unit to address all of these different concerns. You know, it can't be censored. 
you can't be shut off. You can send transactions and get liquidity 24-7, 365. It's not subject to being in a physical location where somebody could you know, in, in, encroach on that. It doesn't have maintenance costs or anything like that, right? It's purely a store of value type of play. And in addition to that, it is absolutely fixed in supply. No more units of Bitcoin can ever be created. Again, unlike the stock market, unlike real estate, unlike a lot of the other store values, basically all other store value assets that are out there. And yeah. so all of these things put together and assuming economic rationality from the, the global population, there will continue to be a move of capital out of these other subpar assets and into the optimal store value asset, which is Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I would add one thing to that. Stocks are not your property, right? So you use a broker and, and it says, well, you have this amount of stocks, but they are not your property, uh, property, right? And then you can say, well, I have a contract with stockbroker, et cetera, but you're, you're dealing in the world of IOUs for sure. I, exactly. It's not yours, right? What I like about Bitcoin is that you can approach it in so many different uh, ways, right? I, I think all, all the things that you just said would hopefully to the curious enough person allude to questions to ask you, like, why can you explain, right? Like, okay, you said there's absolute fixed supply, but who can change that? Or, you know, the, the people who hold the 50% of the Bitcoin, that's only five people, they can change it. I had this discussion yesterday, so um, <laughs> it's still fresh. I think these are the good arguments, right? To, to You don't have to pitch Bitcoin itself, but you can pitch how it is different from other property or from other assets and, and what different properties are. And then it's up to this other person, you know, to just ask the questions. Okay, why? Oh, that triggers me. Oh, absolute scarcity. Why? Like, how is that enforced, etc. Right. But especially also for this crowd, I mean, I, I you know, I said I've I've been to this like fire subreddit. I've t I've talked to people about fire. There's a resistance to Bitcoin in some way, and I'm 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 a bit confused by it because as I as I just said, like I see these people kind of like us, like analytical nerds, geeks who try to figure something out, you know, spreadsheets, stuff, stuff like that. But, and also connecting to what you just explained, right? They are playing this game to improve their life, right? I think that's great. I think it's, it's amazing to think about this consciously and see how you can live life more versus being lived by, you know, a job that you hate, you know, uh, you know that, that's, that's horrible. So I think the goal is similar. But when they dive into this research, you know, they're playing this game of, of, yeah, like percentages or moving banks or whatever. So pretty deep into it. But I've never seen discussions about what are we accumulating actually? You know, like what, what, what are these units that we are accumulating? What is money? And I think that's kind of the, the extra layer of depth that eventually, well, at least hooked me into Bitcoin because I also saw all these you know, stock games and funds and all, and all these things. But once I realized that they are in it to accumulate more money units that are being debased over time. It feels like there's, it's, it's, it could be an infinite game if it goes really bad, right? And then you've played this fire game for 10 years, you know, trying to get to your number. And then maybe your country turns into Lebanon and there's a hundred percent inflation and, and then everything you have done would be futile, right? And this intellectual question of what is money, I think, yeah, again, probably also drove you more towards Bitcoin when you understand that this is an entirely different thing. Why do you think there's this resistance against either Bitcoin itself or going a bit deeper? Is it just, you know, yeah, I don't know. What 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 is is that about curiosity? It seems that these people have a lot of curiosity. So Yeah. I, I think that these fire practitioners who are opposed to Bitcoin or kind of dropping all the usual FUD, I mean, it is there's nothing new under the sun, right? None of the arguments that are being made are anything new. Um, it's all the same, you know, slurs of beanie babies and you know, it can be copied and there's a million crypto coins and why Bitcoin and the government's going to shut it down and this and that. I think part of it is that, you know, there is a, there's something to be said for like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And from their perspective, things are working, right? Like mm -hmm. this strategy of 
saving whatever you can and buying the stock market index, it's working. It's working perfectly fine. You know, are you enjoying lower purchasing power returns than you would have in Bitcoin? Sure. But like, why, why change it up and do all of this like mental work to understand what you're buying in order to, to take advantage of that? This is working, so I don't need to, to worry about it. I think part of it is just our innate human, you know, proclivity to follow those people in positions of authority or thought leadership. And there really haven't been many people who have that influencer status within the fire community who have done a lot of the groundwork education over the last, you know, 10, 15 years who are staunch Bitcoin advocates, right? And in a lot of times mm -hmm. they are, they are very much against Bitcoin. Mr. Money Mustache, I'm going to call him out. Actually, the, the very first issue of my, of my new newsletter on Substack is kind of a nod to Mr. Money Mustache and his article entitled Bitcoin is stupid or why Bitcoin is stupid. And he goes about in that article, this was written in early January, like January uh, 2nd, 2018, just after the a massive correction from $20,000 after it run up from $200. So it went hundred X up to 20,000 and then it dropped 50% in a matter of a couple of weeks. And then mm -hmm. it was back up to like 14,000 or something when he, when he released this and it's all the same FUD. It's all the same, you know, beanie babies, tulip mania, like all of that kind of thing. There's, there's nothing new in, in terms of that argument. And th but this is a big said, influencer, oh, right? Like this, this is, is a very famous, influence. he has a blog, right? Is that? Is yeah. That yeah. He has, he has a yeah. blog, Mr. Money Mustache. Go, go okay. look it up. He has a lot yeah. of great stuff. He definitely has more of a lean fire type of, of a, of a lean to him, so to speak in, in that it's very much about frugal li living and, and all that. And that's great. Like his writing was influential for me in, in the way that I approached and was learning about the fire movement and setting about my personal financial independence journey. But like you read something like that and it's just, it's just, it's just not smart. It's stupid in and of itself to come out and have not done any real work and then just spout platitudes uh, for something that you really don't understand. But a lot of people. But now you're that. saying he should study more, and and people always hated when people <laughs> when you say that. Well, when when so now fast. Let's fast forward mm -hmm. to you know October of 2024. Um, the price when he dropped that post was fourteen thousand. Now we're at sixty two thousand or sixty three thousand, whatever it is. It's a tough pill to swallow for any type of public figure to come out and say, "Look, I wrote this thing. Why Bitcoin is stupid? That was wrong, very obviously." I've done the research. I actually think it's not a bad idea to have some type of allocation to Bitcoin. Like that's very difficult for somebody who's kind of built a reputation and a following on exactly the opposite view to do. And so we shouldn't expect that that's going to happen. But I think, you know, I'll, I'll die on this hill. The, the best thing that can happen for Bitcoin adoption as much or as little as we would like it to be is just number go up technology as the price rises, more people are attracted, it's like the top of the funnel, right? And then people start to do a little bit of, of work. Some portion of those people start to do a little bit of work. Uh, the rest of them will sell at a loss probably after they are dealing with the volatility. But those people who have put in a little bit of work, they will realize, oh, I've actually got something here that I shouldn't let go. And I'm going to learn more and I'm going to continue to accumulate and I'm going to hold my own keys and do this the right thing, the right way. Um, and so that stair step that we have of new entrants and new adopters coming in and there's a, there's a ratchet effect there right like m very very few people come to bitcoin and adopt it and and develop mm -hmm. conviction on it and then decide oh actually like i changed my mind this is not for me right yeah. so that is going to be the number one thing that attracts any and all adopters and and very much so the fire community. I'm starting to see a few people out there on on Twitter and, and other places be a little bit more open minded to it. I think that will continue as as the next bull market like kicks into high gear. I like this YouTuber. I think it's the fun. I don't know if it's the fun Graham. I think his last name is Graham. He also has a few million on, on YouTube and he talks about personal finance a lot, not specifically fire, but he's also slowly getting 
hmm. more and more into Bitcoin. I think he was actually the first person who had Giovanni on who, who came up with this Bitcoin power law. Hmm. And I thought it was actually very interesting that this more traditional finance person went into this really, really deep Bitcoin topic. But again, you know, if, if this is your interest and if you're studying this, yeah, eventually it's undeniable that Bitcoin is a serious asset that you should study and at least consider, right? So I, I mean, I it think, certainly is not taboo anymore for you to consider yeah. whether or not you should buy a little bit of Bitcoin, right? And yeah, I agree. You know, you've got presidential candidates out there talking about it. You've got BlackRock and Larry Fink out there talking about it. You've got Michael Dell. You've got, you know, celebrities and athletes who are taking paychecks in Bitcoin and, and that kind of stuff. You know, it's like there's a snowball effect here. And for, for better or worse, humans are very much influenced by the that that celebrity status and leadership taking a position. And so, you know, Bitcoin's incentive structure aligns such that as those people adopt it, other people will come. That reinforces the price and the adoption level. And when you start to see your circle of friends and you look around and and you know, out of 10 friends, six of them own Bitcoin, it ain't so weird anymore, right? It's not, it's not so different yeah. or out of place for you to say, oh yeah, I bought a little Bitcoin. Oh yeah, I've had some, some Bitcoin. Hey, let's go to the bar and I'll pay you back in, in Bitcoin instead of using Venmo or something like that. Right. So, yeah. So how much, of course, this depends on, on the number that you want to reach, right? I don't know if from your research, you, kind of know this average number that people are like going for, right? But how much Bitcoin does one need to be able to get to this financial independency and retire early? Like what's what's the calculation there? It's really just another side of the same coin for that 4% rule and how you're calculating your fire number. So of course, when the Trinity study was being done and the way that the fire proponents are thinking about their financial independence number, it's denominated in dollars. And of course, that corresponds to a certain amount of Bitcoin. So it depends on how much the price can go up as to how much Bitcoin that you actually need, right? So let's say that you did spend $40,000 a year and one Bitcoin reaches 1 million. You know, that is a translation to real world purchasing power, right? And so you should be thinking of it that way. When you're on a Bitcoin standard, your purchasing power is always going to go down because there's absolutely fixed supply of, of Bitcoin and the number of goods and services and the quality of those things, you know, continues to grow. And so it's just an infinite numerator over a fixed denominator. Your purchasing power will grow over time, but it remains to be seen how fast that will be. One other way to think about this, right, is look, I, I've got a certain amount of Bitcoin. Let's say I've managed to accumulate a, a pretty large sum of like 10 Bitcoin, right? And I've decided that, okay, I've reached my fire number and I'm going to draw this down at 2% over the next year. Well, you could denominate that in dollars or you could denominate that in Bitcoin if you wanted to. You know, 2% of 10 Bitcoin, the purchasing power that you're drawing over time from that same 2% of whittling into your stack is going to grow, you know, very, very rapidly such that in the first year, you may be able to handle just the expenses that you've kind of planned for. But in year 10 out of 50 there, you are in like able to spend 10 times the amount or five times the amount or something like that on that same amount. So maybe you could draw it down a, a little bit or draw less of that stack. It really just depends on how fast that purchasing power increases. Yeah. Yeah. I was just Googling for the Bitcoin the Kager, the compound annual growth rate. I think it is somewhat correct what I just, what I see here, but like last five years was 45%. Over 10 years, it's 63% a year. I mean, this, this does seem like the price appreciation. I mean, we can go into this whole discussion about diminishing returns, which I don't generally follow, but let's say it stays with 45% a year. I mean, that would add to your argument that you just shared, you know, about why it's fire friendly. I mean, this is, this is way more than any other general 
asset that you can use, right? And so you would be able to get there quicker and also compared to yeah what you would the, what you would take out every year yeah will always be less than 45% right so it, it'll it'll keep uh, growing if you just yeah just let let your stack grow basically yeah how do you see that because i think people are now calculating with these you know compounded uh, returns of uh, and then i don't know they use percentages over like the last 10 20 years or you know the calculation that that you shared before is this something to take into account it is you know when again going back to the trinity study and and the way that the fire practitioners approach that 4% rule is assuming you know call it 8 to 10% of nominal returns for the stock market index which should be above and beyond any inflation rate that is being calculated and leave you with a little extra cushion there of real return that you're able to to bank for yourself right so yes if if your average return on a yearly basis goes from 10% to 45% i mean you're going to get to your fire number much quicker or you could work the same amount of time and you'll have a much larger portfolio to draw down from. You know, you can somehow blend that, be like, okay, well, you know, I was going to work for another 10 years and that's how I, I estimated I'm going to reach my fire number. I'll still work that 10 years and I've got a bigger thing, or maybe I'll just do seven years because now my, my portfolio is so much bigger with Bitcoin. Yeah. My my view, uh, it, it sounded like you were kind of asking like my view on what the returns might be over the next, call it 10, 15, 20 years. I, I'm, my base case is that we actually go higher than that 45% in the near term, like within the next 10 years or so. And then from there, from kind of like a higher level, we start mm -hmm. to, to come down a little bit in terms of the marginal returns diminishing over time. Um, and, and I just think that is indicative of the s curve type of adoption that we're in and we're at the very bottom of that s part of it where it starts to to kind of go vertical so yeah. i'm expecting that the price is going to follow that type of a model as opposed to just continually having diminished returns every four years or, or whatever we've we've been experiencing yeah i i agree with that M mainly also because you know in in 2033 99 of all bitcoin uh, will have been mined, right? And the last 1% will be mined in the 107 years after. And yeah, I, I, I see it like this. I mean, Michael Saylor also talks about this, right? Like this is the Bitcoin gold rush, whether people understand that yet or not, the, the last 1% is a rounding error. You know, those 107 years are a rounding error compared to what is left from now until 2033 so once people realize that this is the most superior asset you know compared to all these other assets that that you already talked about people will start moving towards this you know, better store value asset and we'll see this this gold rush that that's also why i would urge everyone to follow your newsletter who is interested in fire because you generally don't have a lot of time right to build this up i mean like if you are a millennial and you are in your furnace, you could actually do this in in five to ten years if you would be starting now. That's what I think. You know, like especially with Bitcoin. Yeah, you you can get there quicker compared to to using these other assets. What, yeah, well, just speaking yeah. from personal experience, you know, I, I started being very heavily into an intentional plan for fire for myself, my family. And I was fully expecting that to take upwards of 10 years or maybe more like 10, 12 years or so for me to like really get to that, that number that I was going for. And I got there in five. And that is in large part wow. due to the fact that I, I, I found Bitcoin and was kind of, I was already pretty much down the rabbit hole when I started with fire. And then my, my conviction grew in a very rapid pace around 2019, 2020 timeframe. And then from there, it was like, okay, forget about these index funds. You know, Bitcoin is the thing. And, you know, I was able to accumulate enough to make a very meaningful impact on the timeline that I was working with. So, yeah, amazing. and and I don't think that that's out of the realm of of grasp for anybody who's starting right now. Like, if you're 22 years old and you're you know in your first job, start early, be intentional, you know, 
start with that 10% and work from there. Don't spend money on stupid stuff, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't enjoy your 20s. Like you're only going to be in your 20s once. You should definitely enjoy it, right? And and the earlier you start and the faster you go up front, the quicker you will bring that timeline toward the present time and then be able to be in a position to move in whatever direction you want with your life and with your career and with the place that you live and all that, right? So it really is about opening up possibilities for you and and developing financial independence in the sense that you you're not worried about, you know, covering the expenses that you've got or that you expect or any unexpected expenses that might pop up. But also, you know, if you adopt Bitcoin, there's a, a different flavor of financial independence that you get when you are actually holding on to that asset, you're holding your own keys. There is an an extra layer of financial independence from the fact that you unilaterally control that asset, right? And that nobody can come between you and your money. There's no there's no local government to in, encroach on your property, your your real estate. There's no broker who can shut you out of your account. You truly own that that wealth. You can access it at any time, and you know Bitcoin is unique in that regard. Yeah. So how how do you see the general challenge of having a long time horizon when saving or investing for for the future? Like what you know why why is it so difficult to keep trusting yourself over time? Like does it have to do with understanding the thesis of what you're investing in, or maybe the question is, do you actually need to understand what, like, like, is that needed? Like, I think it's needed, but for example, the people in fire movement that use, I don't know, as S&P index fund or Vanguard, something, something, I don't know if they understand it, but do they actually have to understand it? And do you think that's also the case with Bitcoin? I think they're leaning more on the historical trends and the historical foundation of what has happened before as doing the majority of the lifting there in terms of what they are trusting as part of this process. And and again, like it has worked. I expect it will continue to work, you know, like for the time being, um, I know very a lot of people are black pilled and the US is going down the drain and all that. Like I'm very much optimistic on that front i think you know the the sun is still shining on the us at least for the time being call it the next 30 40 50 years like there's some deep structural issues that need to be addressed but nothing that can't be overcome and it's not going to turn overnight you know what i mean so these things take a long time to play out and so you know i'm pretty confident that you can trust that the us stock market is going to continue to por- perform well and at least from a nominal standpoint it's going to continue to go up because they have no po- no other choice than to print money, right? There's no other choice than to expand the denominator that your that your assets are are being measured in, right? So that will continue to happen. And but but I think buying Bitcoin, because it's not widely adopted, because when you look around at your friend group and your family, very few of them actually own it and and almost none of them understand it, it does take a little bit more work to develop conviction that what you're buying is something that you are going to be able to hold on to for a very long time that is worth holding on to for a very long time and that can substitute in a better way for a stock market index or real estate or whatever the other asset of your choice is um so you do need to have like there is a little bit of a historical press precedent here but we're yeah. only talking about 15 years as compared to 120 years for the stock market right so it's not nothing but it's definitely a shorter time frame and so you need that extra level of conviction that only comes from doing a little bit of work to understand what you're buying yeah i think it's funny when you said they look at the historical perspective and then they project that towards the future or they get they take a certain safe margin and then use that to calculate towards the future where i think with bitcoiners we just look towards the future we do the calculation towards the future of the dollar denominator and you know that's greg falls who says uh, do just do the math right like it's just math you know it's going to debase so you need something else than that to save your energy and then so i i i, I think that's an interesting thought like projecting towards the future based on the on the past i would argue is inferior to looking at the future and then projecting that on the present and then acting in 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 the present yeah 
choosing to yeah i mean there's, there's a lot that can be learned from the past right i mean mm. we I, I know you're saying that in the context of bitcoin we're just looking toward the future but really we are looking toward the past in terms of the way that the financial system has been structured and the trends associated with the amount of debt that is being built up across the globe not just in the us and then using that historical precedent to project the trends that are likely to continue based on demographics and those long-term trends based on, you know, just the political landscape and the proclivity from the previous crisis in 2020 to the crisis in 2008, you know, every one of these things is met with more and more like a bigger and bigger bazooka, right? Basically just papering over the problem and everybody flying at the, at the seat of their pants, trying to just solve that, that, issue at hand as opposed to addressing the root problem and yeah. in reality the root problem can't be addressed really without significant devastation economically so we yeah. know from historical precedent and from the incentive structure that's in place that they really have only one option and that is to continue to play the game out the way that it's yes. been played yeah. and then we know from our understanding of bitcoin and how it works the fact that it can't just be just go away the fact that the Bit that the government can't just shut it down the fact that you can actually control it yourself we know from the work that we've done and our conviction in in 21 million that it will continue to outperform every other asset because we understand the nature of that thing yeah um, so all of that historical context goes into developing conviction for what the future is going to be. It's just a different type of historical context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, yeah, fair point. Fair point. Easy. Yeah, well said. I think I think yesterday I tweeted this. It's and I think you just said it very well. Like they are not going to stop trying to keep this fiat money thing alive, right? Okay. So they, they will continue doing that. They will continue printing. They will continue keeping kicking this can down the road. They cannot stop doing that, right? So the, the, the basement of fiat is mathematically assured, right? And the increase in value of Bitcoin is mathematically secured, right? It, it will always stay the same. That's the entire output. And, and I argue also the value of Bitcoin is it stays the same. As you said, it's 21 million. That's it. Like that's the entire point is it never changes. And that is where the value comes from. Because if you compare it to the fiat money system that has been changed constantly. And that is what the essence of, of the problem is. And uh, yeah, I, I told you before we, we started recording, once I realized this, that I can just move everything that I save from this, well, unpredictable, but also predictable, you know, debasing fiat money to, yeah, this other system that is Bitcoin that I understand. And, and, and the core of what I understand is that it will never change. Yeah, that's just when I moved, right? That's when I sold the fiat and, and, and bought the Bitcoin. And that's also how I see the price, right? It's an exchange rate. It's not a price, right? It's an exchange rate between one money and, and, and another money. And well, the longer you wait, the more it goes up. But of course, it also goes down sometimes, right? Like Bitcoin moves in these cycles. So when you plan for the, for the future and, and, and you said, you know, like, let's say you started with fire with dollars in 2007 and everything crashed. I mean, in Bitcoin, it also goes up and down. How do you handle this volatility and, and how do you explain that to others? I don't normally try to orange pill anybody or bring anybody over to say, hey, you should buy Bitcoin. But when people ask, I tell them what I think and I, and I answer their questions. And one of those questions is always about volatility. And when somebody has decided, okay, hey, Trey, show me how to buy a little bit of Bitcoin. I will show them. And... Basically, what I will tell them is you're going to make this purchase. And as soon as you do, it's going to drop by 30%. Just expect it. It will happen. It will happen. 30% the next day you make this pr first buy. You just got to know that going in. And then I always follow that up by saying, and if you don't make this purchase, it will go up by 30% immediately. You cannot escape this. Like mm -hmm. there's no point in trying to time it. A lot of people want to time it. it's like oh man it's so expensive maybe i can get it a little bit cheaper and they're they're trying to like hedge this volatility in their own minds by trying to be smart and cute about it what i typically will tell people if they decide hey i'm going to make like somewhat of a substantial allocation is just buy half of it now right 
Um, no, no financial advice here, right? All the normal disclaimers. This is what I do with my own is that I'll buy half of it and then I'll average in the other half over a set period of time. Maybe it's four weeks or 10 weeks or something like that. So that you, you address the immediate problem, which is that you don't have this allocation yet. <laughs> You've got that money in there for half of it. And then you also address the emotional problem that comes with holding an asset that's as volatile as Bitcoin is without really internalizing yeah. its value and why it's so important and why these short-term price movements are inconsequential. It will be scary if you haven't internalized that. And so you can use these different approaches to help make that process a little bit more emotionally easy. Um, yeah. And really like the emotional side of this is is so important. It's important in the way that you approach your fire plan. It's important in the way that you approach holding even stocks because stocks can be very volatile. Bonds can be very volatile. I mean, we saw that in the last <laughs> in the last year or year or two, right? So you just have to understand this stuff going in and decide up front, this is not going to bother me. I have a plan for that, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's intentionality and and knowing that you're thinking about this in a five, 10, 15, 30 year time horizon as opposed to, hey, I'm gonna make a quick buck here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great tip. You know, people should get, if they are interested a little bit into Bitcoin to experience it, right? And then you, you will be drawn into it because you will read about it. You will follow it. The price goes down. You think like, why? There's no real explanation because it didn't really change. It goes up. Also no explain, explanation, right? So it'll draw you in. But yeah, I, I, I agree with just, you know, widening out that time frame before you get in more because yeah, if you go in with a with a too big of a position while you don't necessarily understand it enough, right? Enough, I say enough, like enough for yourself. That's you know different for for each person, of course. Yeah, then you will sell, and then it goes up again, and you will be disappointed. And also, if you don't have enough and it goes up, then you will be disappointed that you didn't have more. But it's it's, I think you said it really well. Like it's about creating again enough understanding for yourself that you can then base your conviction on. And then you will start to yeah, experience these these price changes. Also when it goes up a lot, right? That's that's just as wild as when it goes down thirty percent. Right. For it's, sure. It's the same, it, it's the it, same it emotional. Impossible. Thing. It is impossible to escape the euphoric feeling that you have when yeah. this is yeah. skyrocketing. Well, I'm a genius. You will feel <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And yeah. and you just gotta realize like Take a step back. Yeah. You're you're not a genius. You definitely you're seeing something earlier than a lot of other people. But just keep in mind, like this is a long term play, and yes. you're you're not in this for like making the quick buck. You know, it, it's it's important to say stay centered in yeah. in the good times and in the bad. Yeah. Well, I th I think this is a really nice overlap again with this fire movement, right? Like planning for the long long term, building your conviction or understanding or however you want to call it. Yeah, I think that's great. And you, I and you will hear that same type of rhetoric when you mm -hmm. are reading or listening to a lot of the people who are talking about fire, right? Is that, you know, hey, the stock market's crashing. Great. Here's an op here's an opportunity to buy more and get more for the money that you're that you've saved. You're really just transposing that mentality into Bitcoin, which is also a massively long duration asset that is built as purely as a savings technology and just happens to be in a position to grow much more more quickly than than the stock market. Yeah. All right. Last two questions. What makes you most bullish on the future of Bitcoin? What makes me most bullish is just the fact that it's so early that I look around at my friend group and actually, you know, there are a few of them who have come to me and started to buy Bitcoin, but not really in size, not really to any material amounts. And the majority of them have not even begun. They're starting to ask the questions in some in some cases, but it's just not there in any meaningful way. And all of those people will own some Bitcoin at some point in the next 10 years because it will become a part of everyday life. And with that adoption comes massive convexity in the price massive reflexivity in the price because there's an absolutely fixed supply of 21 million. It's one of the most important characteristics of Bitcoin is that 
It has that fixed supply that cannot be manipulated, that cannot be controlled by any kind of central banker or any other corporation or private individual. It is just there for you to adopt it or not. And as more people adopt it, the price will reflect that that wider adoption. It's going to go a lot higher. Yeah. Yeah. I, I cannot wait to see that, right? Like I, I, sh- I shared many times on a podcast, like I feel like we are sitting in a seat in a stadium and, you know, we have our popcorn and we have our drink and we are watching just this, this thing unfold, right? Like it's just, man, it's so, it's so entertaining. I, I'm, I'm really, really excited also just for the next 10 years, right? Until we get to this 99%, you know, the, the, the madness that we think is going to happen. I, I think it's going to happen, but it's just really entertaining too. To Absolutely. Follow. Yeah. It's fun. it's going to be a blast. It's going to be yeah. fun. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which is, and someone spoiled it on Twitter already before we recorded. So maybe you thought about it. I asked <laughs> everyone, what is a core belief that you will never let go? So I did see that. And I'm really glad that I saw that so that I wasn't put on the spot. Thank you to whoever that anonymous individual was on X. I'm going to do something that might get me into a little bit of trouble here, especially with this election season. The thing that I think is true that I do not let go of is that national politics and this coming election and your vote do not matter. They don't matter to you and your life in the near term, in the next 10 years or so, it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to what's going on and be knowledgeable as to the situation that you find yourself and be able to react, but you actually have no power over that from an individual standpoint. Like Your vote mathematically does not matter. You are not going to change anything by going to the ballot box. If you, if you vote, you have no way to, you have no way to verify that that vote was recorded correctly. If you could verify that it was recorded correctly, you have no way of knowing if it was counted correctly. If it was counted correctly, you have no way of knowing if it was transferred to the election authorities correctly. If it's transferred to the election authorities correctly, you have no way of knowing whether or not your candidate is even going to win. Your your vote is just very, very tiny relative to the overall mathematical thing. If your candidate wins, you have no way of holding them to any kind of campaign promises that they have made. And so like people spend so much time and energy focused on these things that they can't control. But what you can control is the way that you approach your life and your family and your personal finances and the community that is that you're embedded in around you and the way that you approach every day and and how you go to work and the way that you treat people who are actually influential in your life and who you are actually influential in their lives. And so people want to get us all up in a tizzy with national politics and these things that we have zero control, like basically zero control over. And I would hold that you should ignore all of that. Don't get swept up in it. Focus on the things that you can control and make your life better, make your family's life better, your friends' lives better, your community, your local community's life better. Be aware of what's going on and use that to inform how you how you build your own castle, but please don't get swept up in, in all of this craziness. It's not going to do you any good. You're not going to have any impact on it. It's only going to shave years off your life. So it's probably a contentious, a contentious thing to be saying right now a month before the election, but there it is. Well, that's why I ask everyone. I'm just super interested to hear all these, all these ideas. Thanks for sharing this. I, I really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed talking about this topic. So thanks, uh, thanks again. And yeah, I wish you all the best with the newsletter. Of course, I will link to your social profile, your newsletter, so people can follow you and subscribe. And yeah, man. thank you. Appreciate thank that, Brian. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. Obviously, it's a topic that I'm I'm passionate about and care about a lot, and so I always enjoy talking about it and digging into it. And yeah, for anybody who's interested in in fire and Bitcoin, please come come read the newsletter. It's it's gotten off to a good start, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Awesome, man. Cheers. Cheers. Boom. What'd you think? Yeah, fun. Good. I think it's fun. Appreciate you. I, man. I love. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.